So Brocking uh, uh, Adams there very clearly identifies these are two separate po po policy realms, right? Poverty alleviation through tourism and conservation priorities don't really speak to each other. So would it be out of this world to go to Conservation International, some other funding agencies and say, give us funding for training, give us funding for education, give us money for, for, for capital expenditure and for outreach and education. And in their defense, they would say, well, we have sort of done that, but not at the level where that you might be suggesting. Forget it. I got to also start. So we're worried about this power dynamics that we have between um, outsiders and local people. Right. Even if we have the lodge within the local community, aren't we still creating that power gap? And that happens regardless of where tourism happens. Yes, so why should we care if it's between local people and outsiders versus between them? Because local people hold the key to conservation. But I think but what we are still saying is that we are still going to create a conflict between that part of the community that is running the lodge and the other part of the community that is not involved in mm -hmm. the lodge. And we are still only going to employ only a little, a tiny percent of that. So then is tourism the solution? Remember, the, the part of the key learning objective was to critique tourism as a win-win situation. Here, and here's so the difference between those two. We heard in the example that we're using as our, as our punching bag, perhaps de deservedly, we heard that 3% of bed revenue, which I think is just how much you pay for, um, for the actual bed, not the food. But let's imagine 3% of $200 per night. So we're talking about $6 per tourist night. That is returned to essentially the Ethiopian government. Okay? Yeah. Well, that's not a lot of money, but here's the interesting thing. And we deal with the same thing in my community about buying locally versus buy, buying in chain stores. Okay? If you buy locally, this is Bilal's argument, all of that money stays in the community, in the region, in some sense. It goes to the community, they buy uh, materials for building, they buy materials for eating, but it doesn't go away. Now, an investor who builds a hypothetical lodge where 97% of the income doesn't even go to the Ethiopian government, much less the local community, yeah, they spend some money on hiring workers locally. They spend some money in buying food and buying materials locally. And then they invest all of the profits somewhere else. US, England, wherever they keep their accounts. So it's a, it's a big difference, kind of in my thinking, it's a big difference whether you buy locally or whether you buy internationally. You know, do you buy your groceries at Walmart or do you buy your groceries at a, at a supermarket that has two local stores? That's what I do because that money stays in my community. If I buy at Walmart, that money somehow flows out, like three quarters of it flows out of my community and some supports some rich family, I guess they're in Arkansas. <laughs> So to me, that makes a big difference. And that's the crux of the difference between the argument. Yeah, you're right. You're going to create conflicts. Somebody has to have and somebody doesn't have to have the power. But the resources stay more in the community. But that, that the assumes thought. that the resources are shared. So if, let's say, 10 members of a community of 1,000, 10 members get together, have a lodge, then we are assuming that those 10 members take the one that 100% of the profit and spreads it to the 1,000 no. people. All I'm saying, even if those 10 people get all the money, it's good for them. The money still the stays locally. But it gets true. spent locally. Whereas if it goes to some person from another continent, you know they're going to send that money back to their right. bank accounts on that other continent. There's also no, greater transparency. No. no, but you don't know. You, we don't know what the to tourist lodge owner is doing. We know that money is not Maybe, going there. Uh, okay, let's look at yesterday's example. 
we have the lodge, which is supposedly where we had lunch, a local community lodge. But so the guy was selected because he's a haji and he's socially respected. And now his kid has a car, the car that took us, and his wife sells honey and they are doing much better than I knew them in, you know, before five years or so. And that's great, but then... The rest of the people are not benefiting anything. But you have to look at the scale of what's going on here. I agree with all those points and I'm so glad to see that there's debate here because that's exactly what we need. We need this level of debate. I'm not pretending to have the solutions. And if I had the solutions, I certainly would not be standing here today. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> right, but these are things I want us to consider. Remember the overall point that Town has, has, has predicated this entire lecture on. We're thinking 20, 50 years out. Is tourism the silver bullet? I don't think it's the silver bullet, but I don't think we need to throw it out. I think it's part of the solution. There is no unique solution. I agree that there is no unique solution, but I'm saying we should be critical of what we have right now and continue to be critical and not take the mentality of something is better than nothing. I honestly feel that's my personal viewpoint. I think that's problematic. Here's another thing, Emela Sharak. You said something is better than nothing is a bad mentality, but that's from, from our point of view, the academics. We never went and talked to the to the locals who worked at the lodge, the fancy lodge or the, the local lodge. We don't know if they prefer to be, I don't know, washing dishes in the lodge ex as opposed to whatever it was that they were doing before. Right. So this is our point of view saying, this is wrong, you have menial jobs, you don't, you don't have advancement of, you know, of your career and whatnot. But we have not talked to them and asked them, do you feel better about your life now than five years ago? I'm drawing from the literature here. I don't know if the literature interviewed the people, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> no, the literature has interviewed the people. The interview has, lo there is a huge literature on people in protected areas, okay? And I'm drawing from things that people are saying, the collected from case studies from around the world, from Mexico, from Latin America, from East Africa, from Southern Africa, from North Africa, East Asia, you name it. This is, this is something that the academics have identified as being particularly problematic. So, you're welcome to engage in the debate, Mona. I just don't want to waste too much of the limited time we have today. Okay. The other one is to think about enforcement, right? The idea of going moving forward from 20 to 50 years forward. Should enforcement counter every single threat? This was a case for uh, yesterday morning. Three lions were poisoned and were killed in the Maasai Mara. Now, it wasn't just any three lions. These were famous lions. These were lions that were being studied and being, not, they were not being studied, they had been being filmed by BBC's Big Cat Diary, right? And there was this huge conservation outroar because these were famous lions. What now, because these herders had poisoned a carcass because these lions had killed the cattle and the conservationist argument was cattle shouldn't have been there. Right? Who's responsible for enforcement? Are human wildlife conflicts going to grow 10 years out, 20 years out, 30 years out, 40 years out? What type of enforcement will work 50 years out? What kind of investments do we make for enforcement 50 years out? Again, drawing from the literature, more cost effective to bring communities into the arguments earlier rather than to make expensive investments into surveillance and all these other things later on. Right? So, which threats should be prioritized? Those with the greatest impact on tourist dollars? Those with the greatest ecological value? It should ideally be based on consensus. The, uh, the pro on this is that it involves different actors and institutions. Consensus building leads to positive outcomes. That's uniform in the literature. The cons, it's, this is a, consensus building is a very, very lengthy process. Remember Town's example he gave us of uh, in Mexico, 25 years this has been going on. 
in a, in a protected area in southern Mexico, right? And this process can become hijacked by political elites, no matter where you are. Now, here's another one which is a resource scarcity argument, and I don't have time to go into it in too much detail. But again, this is a drawing from these specific uh, literatures, um, Conflicts of a Land and Water in Africa, and uh, a great series of edited volumes, starting with Violent Environments, which, which says that, well, population is increasing, resources are being limited, therefore people will necessarily come into conflict with each other over grazing rights issues, like what you saw with the lion being speared, and so on, right? You've all heard that argument in some way, shape, or form before. And so if we look at, I tried to get local Ethiopia demographics, but the internet was not cooperating with me. This is the population of the world. What shows up is huge. India, China. Africa's population is expected to grow very, very rapidly. It's supposed to be the most rapidly growing population in the next 50 years. It's coming from the continent of Africa. China's population is expected to slow down. India's population is expected to level off. This is where you will see the highest population growth rate in the next 50 years. Okay. Now keep your eyes fixated on this one. And here is a map of consumption. Here's Africa. Let's go back to population. Here's consumption. Right? <laughs> consumption of resources. What did you think it was? Consumption of food. Well, <laughs> that would probably be accurate on this map also. <laughs> right? And so the resource scarcity argument seems to be dominated by the fact that, you know, that it is these poor people living in poor parts of the world that are consuming resources that are rapidly drying up and therefore will necessarily come into conflict with each other. Okay? What's wrong with that argument? Is it, a, well, first of all, let's start with positive. Is it appealing? Michael's shaking his head. Why not? Well, it doesn't reflect the reality. It doesn't reflect the reality. Anyone else? In what way? Let me push you further and then we'll come to Abedja. <laughs> In what way does it not reflect the reality? Because when, when you say, uh, because this area, is going, Africa is going to have the highest uh, growth rate, it doesn't mean that they will as well be consuming the resources. Okay, at the same rate? Yes. Okay. Abeja? Uh, mine is your question. That means, does it mean that an increment of the population leads to uh, increase their consumption? Yes, so, so the way this argument would work is that Ethiopia currently has 100 million people. Uh, optimistically, you're looking at a population growth rate of 3% on the low end, more likely 5%, which means your population would likely double from 100 million people to 200 million people in 35 years. Now, think about the pressure on the resources we have right now in Ethiopia. What do you do when you're essentially doubling that population? The resource scarcity argument will suggest that, wow, still on. Uh, the resource scarcity argument would suggest that people will consume the already re meager resources and then cobble up some of the conservation priorities also, right? What's wrong with that argument? 